Welcome to episode 8 of the Book of Esther podcast in which we take a very broad um, view of issues raised by the Book of Esther, a wonderful book which uh, as much to teach us about God and his dealings with his people and salvation history. Um, today we start just with an item about the funeral of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II which took place yesterday. This was an extraordinary event, something that, that I haven't seen in my lifetime and one sees many people dressed in all kinds of different costumes marching around here and there and everywhere. But all of this is um, designed to show that this has been the death of a very great person, as I believe indeed that is the case. Um, but what, what many, many people um, hold or held Queen Elizabeth in extraordinarily high regard here in the United Kingdom. And it's very difficult for me not to do the same. Uh, much evidence has been presented to uh, to suggest that Her Majesty the Queen was a true Christian and it's very difficult for me to argue against that. I'm not going to try and argue against that. God knows whether she was a Christian but she certainly was public about her Christian profession and she also um, had uh, a, clearly a very significant role in to play in the arrangement of her funeral um, which was obviously arranged in advance and the, what I think I really want to bring out this now is quite simply that during this funeral there was an extraordinary amount of gospel um, profession and content, Christian content, gospel content. And this was being broadcast to billions of people, billions of people it is said throughout the world who were watching the funeral live. And that's something as Christians which we can take heart for can't just take for granted that there will always be Christian services, Christian um, state events in this country. <clears throat> if it happened, it's because somebody wanted it to happen. There's always this war against the gospel, against truth. It could very easily have been an interfaith service that the Queen had. And one wonders if this comes to the same place with King Charles what kind of service would be had. This is because somebody wanted it this way. Somebody wanted gospel input. And even the church authorities who were responsible for the religious aspects of the funeral service, they themselves have not been known for any kind of gospel commitment or commitment to the truth of justification by faith or preaching the atonement of Jesus Christ. So if this happened and if this gospel content was there, it was because somebody, Her Majesty the Queen, wanted it to be there. And it may be that this was the greatest broadcast of the gospel in history. And it may be that there will never ever be another broadcast like it again. As a Christian, I find myself praying that the gospel content would be understood by those who heard it in different parts of the world and in the United Kingdom, that this wasn't just something that was um, should wash over them. So, for example, uh, if you go to the Daily Telegraph, you can get the whole of the order of service and the, all the words that were used in both the service at Westminster Abbey and the service at the chapel in Windsor. And early on in the procession of the coffin into Westminster Abbey, we have the sentences where John 11 verses 25 to 26 was either sung or quoted. I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That was sung or read to billions of people. May God give them understanding. And those who are Christians may give them hope and encouragement and strength to know that this was read publicly in such a place at such a time. And then I'm going to move on down here. I mean, I'm missing out material here. Strong Christian gospel, biblical material. But as I move on down here, and uh, consider what's here. There's, there, there's some stuff that might be considered to be weak, double speak, not Christian. But there is such a strong Christian witness here. Thank God for that, that that went out throughout the nations. So we move to the first lesson, which was read by the Right Honourable the Baroness Scotland of Astral KC, Secretary General of the Commonwealth. And she read, and this is amazing, she read 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 26 and 53 to the end. Now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by Adam, by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 
but every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who giveth, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. That is glorious gospel scripture. Do you think the Queen was trying to tell us something? And that ends with thanks be to God. And then there's Psalm... Um, psalm reading the choir sings like as the heart desireth the water brook so longeth my soul after thee O God my soul is a thirst for God yea even for the living God when shall I come to appear before the presence of God and then <clears throat> in the second lesson read by the Prime Minister Liz Trust we re we, she reads John 14 verses 1 to 9a I won't read the whole excerpt but let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you into myself, unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And then they sang Psalm 23, The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. And also, um, well, there was Justin Welby preached, but I don't know that Justin Welby, who's the Archbishop of Canterbury, has ever preached a gospel sermon. I, I, I don't know. Um, he doesn't appear to be on fire for the gospel, that's for sure. Um, and then we have, towards the end, the singing of the hymn, Love divine, all love's excelling, joy of heaven to earth come down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure and bounded love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. And a great hymn by Charles Wesley. Now I just want to... Um, and the, the blessing at the end was as follows, and this is really important also. God grant to the living grace, to the departed rest... To the church, the king, the commonwealth, and all people, peace and concord, and to us sinners, life everlasting. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. It's those words, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is so important. Britain has declared, through the death of her queen and the burying of her queen, Queen Elizabeth II, that God is a holy trinity, that there is only one God, but he dwells he exists as a God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, three persons within the Godhead. That is an extraordinary statement. That's gone out to billions of people. That is gone round the world. So whether or not the people who were singing, reading, and listening to these things in Westminster Abbey believed them, understood them, were moved by them, these things are true. And this, Queen Elizabeth ensured that her death was a profound witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. I could go on and talk about what was said in um, the chapel in Windsor. I don't think we will ever see such a thing again. I mustn't end, underestimate the power of that as a gospel witness to the nations. Um, and how thankful we should be to God for that, that, that the... With all, with all the, the, it's easy to be critical. There will be those who now are sitting down, writing down articles on why the Queen's funeral showed her to be X, Y, or Z, or there was such and such and such and such. For example, there was a, a cardinal dressed in red who was very prominently seen on the TV cameras, um, and that could represent a, a, a reversal of the Reformation, something we dread, something we hope will never happen, but is very much um, possible in the current generation. 
but we may never again see such profound public witness and we may never again see such profound elevation of Jesus Christ as the saviour of the world, as the one who saves those who come to him, of if the Queen has expressed her own confidence through this service, strong confidence in Jesus as a saviour, and also confidence in the Christian gospel and the Christian God, not the gods of the nations, not the idols, not an interfaith service where every god is equal or where all roots lead to God. And we, should, we shouldn't overlook this. We shouldn't forget that this is what has happened. This is what has happened in the United Kingdom, in a country that's forgotten God, in a country that's forsaken the gospel, in a country that's forgotten these very truths that have been declared. And oh, may God have mercy upon us as a nation. May he be pleased in these days to send forth his light and his truth to the very ends of the earth and to the very ends of the nation, of the world rather. Now, I think, and to, and to the nation, because the nation is confused and blundering around in darkness without the gospel anymore. That's why we must preach the gospel in these days. Now, how thankful we should be to, to God, God for this, and how much we should pray that there would be a preaching of his gospel faithfully to those who are perishing, and we should be those preachers, we should be those who take the gospel to those who are perishing. I don't think it'll be that long before we start to hear of the testimony of those who have been converted <clears throat> or, uh, because they heard the funeral service of the Queen, perhaps in some remote country somewhere, perhaps in some remote place, or perhaps in some city or some developed country. We'll start to hear the testimony of somebody who could not get away from the words of Scripture. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth on me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. The words of Jesus, that this is the gospel, that this is the truth, that Jesus Christ is the saviour of the world. So it might have been a spectacle, it might have been a remarkable, it might have been about a remarkable woman, but it was about an even more remarkable God and creator and saviour of the world. And we thank God for that. God will have his word to go forth to the very ends of the world so that someone from every tribe and tongue and nation will be there on the day of glory. Well, we move on now to the second part of this uh, this podcast. And the second part this week is concerned once again with the book of Esther, with, uh, with the, the dealings uh, of Hahasuerus with Queen Vashti and how he divorced her. So we're going to be considering, in a fairly broad sense, but not a, by no means complete sense, the question of divorce today. Divorce and the Christian, although Vashti wasn't a Christian. And uh, we're going to consider what I think are some important things relating to this, that uh, the, church, the, church, the church is obviously, there's a lot of talk on this topic, there's a lot of consideration of this topic, and some people are very much affected deeply, profoundly, greatly affected by this topic. So it's worth talking about. I hope I can say something that's going to be of help and value to the people of God, uh, whether it affects them directly or indirectly or not at all. I hope I can say something that's going to be of value. But we'll turn back to the uh, book of Esther now and we'll read the short section in chapter 1 um, that deals with the, with the divorce of Vashti. Again, I'm reading this knowing this that this is this is not meant to be a, a Esther. This this part of Esther is not meant to be, a, 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 in any sense, a, a commentary on divorce or, a, or 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 to give us a theology of divorce. None whatsoever. But it's raised and it's important, and uh, we are going through the book of Esther with a desire to look at issues that are raised and then to consider them from a Christian perspective. So this is what we find today. And from my own point of view, I think it's really, really important to talk about these things. So we'll turn back in Esther to chapter 1 now. So I'm just going to read one verse from uh, Esther chapter 1, verse 19, where the king's advisers say to him, If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before King Ahasuerus, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. Now, the subject today is divorce. I suppose the first thing I need to say is that 
I'm not going to try and hurt anybody by talking on this subject because I know that some people listening to this probably are already hurt beyond measure by things that have happened to them, things that they perceive as being beyond their control, things which have been devastating to them, to their lives and to others around them. Divorce hurts. Divorce is horrible. Divorce was never God's way, was it? Divorce is something which has come in because we are sinners by nature and because we're sinners by nature we struggle in our relationships we tr struggle to understand each other and not only do we do that but sometimes we can be extremely savage and vicious towards others sometimes in the open and sometimes secretly and divorce can be a consequence of that as well so if someone's listening to this you're divorced and struggling with the practical implications of that the emotional psychological spiritual implications of that this is not intended to be yet another lashing um for you vashti i've maintained was innocent not everybody agrees with that some people think that vashti was herself to blame got what she deserved she had it coming perhaps she did that's not my opinion my opinion is that vashti took a stand for what was right yes i i know that some historians say that she was a thoroughly vicious and nasty woman and perhaps she was but my opinion is that she was right on this point that King Ahasuerus was wrong but he was embarrassed and he and his advisors because they were embarrassed and they were worried about the effect this would have upon their reputations and upon the authority of men decided to make Vashti an example an example of them being responsible, being guilty, being to blame, but blaming somebody else and making it look as though it was her fault and punishing her for their sins and their crimes and their wrongdoing. Vashti's divorce was an example of injustice, in my opinion. Now, of course, this wasn't a Christian divorce. This wasn't a divorce between two Christians. Divorce is bad enough, but it's much worse if it's between two Christians or professing Christians. But we can still learn a great deal about this. The first thing is Vashti's divorce was unfair. It's really, really important that we say that in marriage and then in divorce there can be an innocent partner. I've heard sermons on the internet by ministers in churches who are very harsh about this and they say it takes two to tango and yes, there's no such thing as an innocent partner in a divorce. And I used to hold that opinion, I used to hold that view myself, but that opinion is ridiculous in the real world, absolutely ridiculous. This divorce wasn't Vashti's fault, she wasn't to blame, she didn't deserve the treatment she got. The second thing is the cruelty of this divorce, divorce can be extremely cruel. The person who wants the divorce can be absolutely ruthless, they can set out to destroy the other person, they can set out to out of greed or out of wrath and anger and a murderous heart, they can set out to kill the other person through the courts, through making sure that they get everything, through making sure that the other person is worn down through legal proceedings, perhaps torn to pieces, torn apart, and just when they are starting to recover, dragged back to court again, solely because of the maliciousness and the gleeful delight that the other person has in causing them and inflicting harm on them. This can happen with narcissistic breakups of marriage, for example, and other forms of breakup of marriage. So, marriage can be extremely cruel and harsh on an innocent partner. There's cruelty here with respect to Vashti. She lost all her estates, she lost her royal crown, she lost her ability to become before the king. She was effectively divorced and who knows she might have had nothing left she could have lost her life but they didn't take that from her but there are many who have gone through a divorce that was inflicted upon them extremely cruelly by the other side there can be great cruelty which is devastating to that person for all kinds of reasons divorce is bad it's difficult it's troubling it's horrible now i can speak from experience because my parents divorced when I was a teenager. I can speak from experience because, very sadly, my wife divorced me. I can speak from experience because one of my own children has gone through this. And so I've seen three generations of this, and it, it is 
devastating, absolutely devastating. It's a testimony to the sinfulness of our hearts. It's a testimony to the fact that even in the best circumstances we struggle because of our corruptions and our wickedness. It's a testimony to something which God hates. He hates putting away, he tells us in Malachi, because of the violence that goes with it. Perhaps it, that um, I was looking at the way in which in the Old Testament some rabbis were teaching that a man could get a divorce for any reason if his wife burnt the toast, for example. And under those circumstances, imagine that you were divorced for burning the toast and then you were cast on the street. You had nothing. You were ruined. You had great distress, no idea where your next meal or any kind of goodness would come from. And such horrible cruelty, such horrible wickedness. And marriage should protect us. Again, that's why I've taken to issue the question of the state watering down marriage. First of all, marriage is redefined because of same-sex marriage, which is not marriage according to the Bible and according to God. Secondly, laws are made for no-fault divorce, and the argument is given that if you want a divorce and you have to go to court, somebody has to be at fault. But what if no party is at fault? Or what if we can just say, well, the marriage didn't work out, so um, let's just dissolve it. And they take... Now, the, you can understand the logic there, but essentially what they're saying is that that marriage should really have no foundation in law. It can be put together and it can be taken apart so easily, just like that, and nobody's to blame, and you move on. And so what is marriage then? Marriage should have two components. It should have, well, it should have three components. Of course, it should have three components. First of all, there should be consent between two individuals who are eligible to marry. Secondly, the state should ratify that. And thirdly, it should be recognised before God. And when the state behaves in the way that it is doing marriage becomes nonsense it becomes meaningless and therefore you find increasing statistics of people aren't getting married and it's well known from research that if where people don't get married and they don't have that security that mere partnerships and cohabiting is a much weaker basis on which to build your lives marriage is important marriage is good marriage is ordained by god marriage is desirable marriage is tough marriage is difficult marriage is challenging but marriage nevertheless is something that is pleasing in God's eyes and something to be valued very, very highly and to be defended and to be hung on to and to be protected and to be revered and to be encouraged and to be upheld. And as I said, young people getting married today have a difficulty in that the state is no longer protecting them. It's just one more thing that's been taken away, one more thing that upholds and helps and establishes marriage. But, And that's very sad indeed, very sad. Now, when I got married, there were was a vow, and that vow said we would stay together until death us do part. Divorce shatters that. And it said in sickness and in health, in riches and in poverty, and for better or for worse. Now, what if your marriage is in sickness and in poverty and for worse? It's still marriage. It's still marriage before God. It's still a God-ordained thing. If one took that vow when one was married, one surely, surely should give oneself to that. Some marriages are like that. Some marriages end up in poverty, end up in sickness and for the worse. But the dedication that those two people have to each other, especially in a Christian Marriage should reflect their strong confidence in God, their faith in God, and their dedication to each other and to serve God together. But also we said that we were told at the time that marriage is not to be entered into lightly or wantonly or inadvisedly. When marriage is discounted, people enter into marriage lightly and wantonly and inadvisedly. If I get married easily, I can get divorced easily. If I marry the wrong person, it's not a problem. I can change them. But in the Bible, marriage is a commitment for life. And Jesus said, didn't he, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The Bible tells us that God hates putting away. Divorce isn't natural. Divorce isn't God's way. Divorce is terrible. 
let's never let's never let's say that marriage is good and divorce is bad so and I know some of you will have gone through divorce and I'm not as I say I'm not trying to hammer anybody I've been hammered enough myself but divorce is bad if divorce has to take place it's bad if divorce goes through it's terrible as a child I knew that because I saw the effect it had on my brothers and on myself it wasn't the end of the world because when my parents divorced I got moved to a different part of the country and I got moved to a different school and I greatly preferred my new school to my previous school now I don't think that but even so my parents divorce had a tremendous impact on me as a child but you see God had appointed a day when I would go from then Lytham St Anne's to St Andrews in Scotland and meet Christians there and then meet with the Lord Jesus Christ as my saviour and whilst these things have happened to meet with the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour to know Jesus Christ is greater than all of these things so if we are going through a divorce if we are divorced if we're on the receiving end of cruel treatment Jesus is greater than all of these things he understands he is the one who will keep you and have mercy upon you and help you and I've known that for these last four years that Jesus is greater than all of these things divorce is bad divorce hurts people divorce hurts the people who are getting divorced it hurts the people who are all around when it comes to the church if Christians get divorced it is so dishonoring to God and our responsibility is that much the greater therefore now as I said about innocent parties there are innocent parties now the idea that there's no innocent parties is that well okay you were angry and therefore that person divorced you but there are so that, that doesn't justify divorce the fact that I'm not a perfect husband doesn't justify divorce the fact that I'm not a perfect wife if I'm a wife does not justify divorce the fact that I have failings the fact that I have been angry at times the fact that I have not always done everything that my husband or wife wanted me to do and it got them ang them angry does not mean that that justifies divorce there are innocent parties there's no such thing as a perfect husband or a perfect wife each has many failings that's why love covers a multitude of sins that's why we have to bear with one another that's why we have to learn to forgive especially in marriage but we must be dedicated to that person and we must be dedicated to that person if, if we're a wife we are to um, love and serve our husbands as Christ loved the church and as, 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 as and particularly as husbands we're told this that we are to, 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 to love our wives as Christ loved the church there is an eye towards the, the glory and honour of Jesus Christ in these things but what happens when one person has given themselves to that other person and that other person is not interested is not seeking reconciliation is not prepared to, to, to fix things is not prepared to mend things is not prepared to work or to work through the difficulties and problems there are some people who get married and they find they're not suitable for each other and soon enough a divorce follows and that's very sad that's very sad perhaps better not for them to get for them not to get married in the first place but now they are married what does God require of them well, I do believe there isn't a marriage that God can't fix. But it does require both parties to be seriously committed to Jesus Christ. That's why Paul tells us that if one person leaves who isn't a Christian, that the believer isn't bound. <clears throat> the believer isn't bound. Because if somebody's not a, not a Christian or behaving like an un, a non-believer, then they they may leave and, and there's nothing that the Christian can do about that if, I, if, if, if you are a husband or a wife and you are committing yourself to Jesus Christ pouring your heart out to God for your marriage and giving yourself and willing to submit yourself to God in this matter but your, your husband or wife who is divorcing you is not willing to do that then that is their responsibility before God I believe that even, well, well, there's some very odd marriages out there, but I believe that and all marriages are between two people who are very different from each other and who are sinners. But I believe that any marriage can, can, can prosper if those parties are both seeking Jesus Christ in their hearts. 
and in their lives. Because I believe that God can fix that. I think, I think that the problem arises when one of those parties isn't. They may think that they are. They may seem to be. But there are innocent parties. For example, supposing a man in a church has a secret liaison with a, someone else's wife in the church because they don't want it to be known. That man, for example, then starts to victimise and to um, mistreat his wife and claims that she has been guilty and responsible for various things and then he divorces her and he gets the support of the church, for example. But all the time in his heart, he's harbouring wickedness and corruption and a secret liaison, adultery, and supposing that that happens, and then the other party gets divorced as well, and then because they've both been declared innocent, they get married, and the church accepts that. But in reality, reality, they both committed the most wicked of sins, and God sees it, and God will require it of them. I do believe that under many circumstances, divorcees can remarry. I believe that the Bible teaches that. And that's not the subject for today's talk. But you see, sometimes, sometimes there is an innocent party, but proving innocence is difficult. And sometimes there's an innocent party who doesn't even know that they're the innocent party. There's somebody out there saying over and over again, what could I have done differently? How could I have saved the marriage? If only I hadn't done this, that or the other. The key thing is this, that whatever our situation, we must take ourselves to the Lord. And when we take ourselves to the Lord Jesus, we can say, yes, I wasn't a perfect husband. No, I wasn't a perfect wife. Yes, I did sin. And no, I, I wasn't um, ever serving you as I should. But, but I am a sinner saved by grace. And as such, I am subject to your love, forgiveness and mercy. And you know the truth, Lord, and you know the truth about me, and you know the truth about what happened to me, and I commend myself to you. There are many innocent parties in divorce. Another example is the example given by Paul where the unbeliever simply leaves. Now, I think that there are those situations where young people get married both of them are professing faith and both of them are seeking to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but eventually one of them falls away. And when they fall away, that person no longer wants to live with somebody who is walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what happened to me. And under those circumstances, Paul says that the believer is not bound. It's very sad when that happens. It's very sad if you marry somebody you believe is a Christian walking with God. You're singing from the same sheet. Um, you're walking in the same direction and uh, then that all comes falling down after so many years and you feel very sad for the person who's fallen away. You wish they hadn't. You wish that they were still walking with Jesus, that this had lasted, that this was genuine, that this had been true. But you can't force a person to follow Jesus. And if somebody becomes an unbeliever, if they're willing to stay, the Bible says they should stay, that you should, as a Christian, keep them. It's not for the Christian to initiate divorce. It's not for the Christian to initiate that thing. Under these circumstances, there are grounds and there are times when a Christian might have to initiate divorce. But in this situation, if the unbeliever, simply because they're an unbeliever, wants to stay, then it's not your business to drive them out. And the churches shouldn't be supporting divorces against people simply because they consider them to be unbelievers. That is absolutely contrary to the word of God, absolutely wrong, absolutely unconscionable. But there are unbelievers who leave. There are those who profess faith and they leave. They can't live with a Christian and therefore they leave. And Paul says that that believer isn't bound. Falling away is one of those things that can lead to divorce, which isn't the responsibility of the Christian, or shouldn't be. The church's attitude is really important as well, because the church can be really cruel and really prejudiced towards people who are divorced. The church would receive somebody who was a reformed murderer. They received the Apostle Paul as an apostle. He was a reformed murderer. 
but as Jay Adams points out in his book on divorce and remarriage, for example, um, some churches won't even allow a divorced person to sing in the choir. If Paul says we're not bound, then to not allow somebody to sing in the choir, whether they be male or female, is a form of bondage, is a form of saying because of what's happened to you, you are somehow tainted, you somehow should be going around like a leper saying unclean, unclean. You can feel like that when you're divorced. And I think the church really has to check this. One of the problems the church has is this, that where there is a divorce, where there is a divorce, somebody is to blame, either one person or the other, or both. And the church does have to think about this, it has to pray about this. It does take time for elders to do that, but compassionate elders will look at this and they should be able to declare that innocent people are innocent. And if they're innocent, they shouldn't be bound and they shouldn't be restricted in this way. It, it's really important as well, because as an evangelist, there are a vast number of people who are divorced. Some are divorced and are remarried. Some have children from this marriage. There's a vast number of people who are divorced out there. And we aren't preaching one gospel to the married and another gospel to the divorced. There's a vast number of people who are cohabiting as well. We're preaching one gospel to everybody, and we have to be able to. We have to be able to invite the divorced into our churches. And we have to be able to invite them to Christ for the salvation of their souls. And when it comes to repentance, because we must all repent when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, some of them will have more to repent of than others regarding this matter. And that's the key to it, isn't it? It's the key to it, is that we are repentant. We're repentant for our involvement in things. But, again... It's knowing, it's knowing who needs to repent and for what. And ultimately, sometimes, neither the elders nor the church nor even the person concerned can know. And that's why they are, I'm asking somebody this. I'm saying, you know, so you're divorced, so your husband left you, so he divorced you. And you're going through every day saying, what did I do wrong? How, can I, how could I have done better? You had no control over things. It went through the courts. Things were said about you which weren't true. Things were said about you which were taken as... Um, unreasonable behaviour and nothing was said about um, the circumstances or, um, or or the things that you had to put up with and you're still thinking was it my fault did I do this the question is not whether it was your fault the question is this have you repented for what was your fault and it's not a question of piling guilt upon guilt it's a pop question it's, it's a case of giving that to Jesus because when I give that to Jesus, I'm washed clean. And when I c commit it to Jesus, my sins are taken away. And when I look to Jesus, I see that he bore that burden on the cross of Calvary for me, so that I'm washed, so that I'm clean, and that although my sins were as scarlet, they're now as white as snow. I may not be able to turn back the clock. I may not be able to go back to things as they were before. But now, from now on, I will serve, I will follow Jesus. But even so, I, I, I really I, I feel this because I know there are some people who blame themselves for things that weren't their fault. I know there are some people who are have been cruelly treated, and yet they don't they don't understand. May the Lord have mercy upon us, all of us. I've said I suffered from the divorce of my parents, and that affected me and my brothers. Divorce affects children. I said that um, I myself am divorced. And I never thought that could happen to me. But now my one prayer is this about this. And I didn't have any control over that. None whatsoever. Nothing I could have done to stop it. Nothing made any difference at all. And yes, okay, I was not a perfect husband by a long way. Not, not at all. But nevertheless, the Lord Jesus has forgiven me. And the Lord has had mercy upon me. Um, but... Divorce, is, it, it, it affects so many other people. It is so damaging to the church. It's damaging to children. It's damaging to everybody. It's damaging to other people's marriages. Divorce is a disaster all round. This is, how, this is what divorce felt like to me. And it may not feel like this way to you, but um, and I hope you're not getting divorced. I hope that your marriage will prosper by God's grace. But 
this is what it felt like to me. It's like one day I was sailing along on a beautiful yacht on a fine, calm sea with bright, bright sunshine and beautiful land in the diff distance. And the next second, the yacht had gone. It was dark and I was struggling to keep my head above water in a tempestuous, cold, icy sea, wondering how I'd ended up in the sea, how it had gone dark. And there was no land around anywhere. That's what it felt like at the time. One minute sailing along, the next minute drowning. Just like that. But the Lord Jesus had mercy on me. And the Lord Jesus is greater than these things. The Saviour that I found so many years ago has shown me that whatever happens to us in this world, whatever happens to us in this world, he is greater than these things. And that if we walk with him, we can come through all of these things and overcome by the power of his blood. It's a great grief when you have to watch one of your children getting divorced. That's all I'm going to say on that, but it's a great grief. So my hope is that from this kind of thing, we would see that divorce is a terrible thing. If someone here is contemplating getting a divorce because they think it's a way out of trouble, give yourself to Jesus. Pray for that person. I hope you do pray for your husband or your wife earnestly every day, for your marriage every day. Don't think of divorce as a solution. It's not. It's a disaster. It's survivable. But don't think that that is the, the way through. OK, if you're being beaten or abused, then you may need to get out. And I'm not going to criticise you for that. I hate the thought of somebody living in a home where there's violence and where they're put at risk. I believe that's the same as desertion because it forces you to leave. But we have to work so hard at marriage. We have to work so hard it's going to hurt, isn't it? It's bound to hurt. It can only, it, But the rewards are going to be so great. So great, so very great. Work at your marriage. Don't, don't, don't think of it as an easy solution, as a way out. Some of us need to repent because we haven't been praying for our marriage. Some of us need to repent because we have been sloppy or lackadaisical. All of us are failure, full of failures. All of us have sinned. Or none of us is perfect. Some of us need help. Finding help can sometimes be difficult. God is our helper. God is the one who cares for us. We can cast our care upon him, for he cares for us, we're told in Peter. Some of us need to repent. Some of us need help. Whatever happens in life, God is over all. God is the... Jesus is sufficient for us. I never would have believed that what happened to me happened to me. I never would have asked for it. It was full of it was full of pain. It was full of difficulty. It still is. But Jesus is so much greater. So this is what I live for. I live for the Saviour who loved me and died for me. I cannot live for the things of these this world because they have been taken from me. I cannot live for this time alone because it is short. But I must live for Jesus Christ and for eternity. The Lord Jesus. His life was cut short when he was 33 years old. The Lord Jesus Christ laid down his life. He came into the world to bear the punishment for our sins. He was acquainted with us, he, uh, our grief. He knew our sorrows. And the Lord Jesus bore our iniquities in his own body on the cross of Calvary. Whatever has happened to us, whatever our situation, Jesus is greater than these things. That's how I got through. That's how I'm getting through. That's how I will get through. Through Jesus Christ. Through knowing him. Through knowing what he has done for me. For knowing that he hasn't cast me off. Through knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't write me off because I'm divorced. Through knowing that the Lord Jesus Christ's love hasn't diminished towards me. For knowing that he still has purposes, loving purposes for me. 
through knowing that he treats me, he is towards me gentle and full of loving kindness. And f through knowing that, that nothing can separate me from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You know something, when I was a teenager and my parents separated and then divorced, I saw, I saw what my mother went through. I'm absolutely amazed at the way that she got through it. She survived because she not only had to find an income and she not only had to find a place to live, but she had to cope with bringing up people like me, teenagers like me. And I can assure you that was not easy. And she did it. And that's extraordinary to me that she managed to do that. Because the way that divorce worked out for her was very harsh and very cruel and very difficult. But she got through. And I can only I can only wonder and be amazed at the strength she showed in doing that. Divorce is marriage is good. Marriage is worth fighting for. Marriage is of God. Divorce hurts. It always hurts. Sometimes there are innocent parties. Repentance restores. And I suppose what I should say also is this finally is this, there must be no room for bitterness. Bitterness is a horrible cancer that eats away at you. There must be no room for anger and there must be love and forgiveness for those who have perpetrated such things. Now, all of these things are humanly impossible. But what's the point of me living my life in bitterness? And what's the point of me living my life in anger? And what's the point of me not forgiving? If I live my life in bitterness, I will be crippled by it. If I live my life in anger, I will be useless. And if I live my life in unforgiveness, then I will show that I myself am more interested in serving my own sinful lusts than following Jesus, who has forgiven me for far greater sins against him. So we need to take our anger and our bitterness and our unforgiveness to Jesus and say, Lord, I have no strength to do this, but that's what I must do. Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Give me the strength to forgive. Take away any bitterness from my heart, totally, completely and forever. And also, Lord, don't let me be angry. Lord Jesus, let me look to you. Let me be so satisfied with you. Let me be so convinced and so aware of your love and mercy towards me that that is my life. Have mercy upon me if I have children. Have mercy on those children. Help me, Lord, to live my life for you now. Make me a witness to your glory and your salvation. Well, this certainly wasn't an exhaustive treatment of divorce and um, others will write whole books on it and preach many sermons on it. But I hope something's been said that's helpful. I hope all that's been said is biblical. Uh, and I hope that that God will help you. And I hope that many people who have been through this sad experience, some with great personal ruin but many of these people would find Jesus Christ as their saviour because the Lord Jesus promised us life and that's exactly what he gives us.